I am very excited to introduce now the keynote speaker, a bold, inspiring change leader, Bandana Tiwari. Well, I'm sure many of you know her already. Uh, Bandana is a lifestyle editor, a sustainable activist, and formerly the editor at large, uh, as well as the fashion features director of Vogue India. Um, she sits on the advisory boards of many impact organizations. Um, she educates people around the world about mindfulness in business with a special focus on Gandhi and fashion. She is known to be a voice for the artisans, you know, sharing their stories, their rich uh, heritage craft, and encouraging the design world to embrace this community, you all as partners. So despite, you know, she's a very, very busy person. So despite a very busy work life, uh, she gave us, uh, you know, her time to this cause, to being a judge uh, for the accessory category. And we are so grateful uh, for all her feedback, ideas, wisdom to scale this impact. Uh, today, her uh, keynote is on craft or, uh, and kranti of the heart and hand. I love this title. Uh, we recorded it just to make sure that, you know, the tech challenges does not interrupt a uh, talk. Uh, but Bandana is in the room. And, you know, I think some of you saw her uh, earlier when we began. And, uh, you know, please send us your questions anytime. She will come on uh, live to uh, answer your questions. So don't forget, send in your questions and giving you Bandana Tiwari. Hello everyone, my name is Bandana Tiwari and I'm sending you all great wishes and good health from the island of the gods, Bali, where I live now. I am Nepali by my provenance. I grew up in India, which is also the land that I love very much. And here I am in Indonesia all countries interconnected with the heritage of craft. So I'm very grateful to Global Eco Artisan Award and Agati for giving me the privilege of being the keynote speaker. And before I start, I would love to say how much I enjoyed being part of the jury. Um, and my congratulations are out there to each one of you participants in whichever hierarchy you fell into or whether you were part of the final countdown, each one of you brought something to the table that had so much heart and soul. And it was a pleasure to look at your products and hear your story and your journey with the work that you're doing. So I thought I'm going to keep my conversation quite um, sort of casual. I didn't want to read out of a four size pages and make it look a little inhumane. I have just made a few points. So I will go through why I chose the topic craft and kranti. Before I get into kranti, I just want to say in Sanskrit, kranti means revolution. And the revolution are of different kinds. Today, as we know, revolutions are happening everywhere. And I want to shout out to the farmers revolution in India, where we've seen an unprecedented number of people, 250 million farmers who have come out onto the streets as a form of nonviolent, civil disobedient protest that was propagated by Mahatma Gandhi, as we know. So my heart, my soul, my ideals, they, they all, I reach out to the farmers and stand by them. And it's very important because the farming community is very much the artisanal community, especially in Asian countries like India, Indonesia, and most parts of Asia. So it's very important to talk about revolution and craft at the same time today because it's extremely relevant. But before I go into Kranti, revolution of the soul, of the self, let's talk about craft. Um, so I made a few notes and you know, what we realize most about craft is like, it's such a wonderful method of learning that reminds us about the humanity in each one of us. It's a different way of creating, which brings human beings at the forefront of the creative act. And so, I think the whole purpose of creativity changes when you talk about human beings at the center. And when I say human beings at the center, human beings allowing nature also to be part of that environment. And we know if you go to any artisan culture, any artisan cluster in any part of the world, you will see the interconnectedness of nature 
and man. For far too long, we've lived in a world where human beings have thought themselves to be the only species that matter. And we've pillaged and we've lived by rules of financial gain that was the only barometer of success. And I think that is a fallacy of modern day capitalism. Most of the countries that I have lived in, almost more than 50% of the people are from the rural parts of those countries. And so much is dependent on farmlands and artisanal skills and craft. So craft needs to be resurrected. And you know, there's a, everyone must know about it, Lee Edelkut, who is a premier trend forecasting expert in the world, named as one of the top 50 influential people in fashion by Time Magazine. Even before COVID, she talks about how it is the indigenous cultures of the world that will be at the forefront of change. And when I suppose when we talk about indigenous cultures, we mean the indigenous techniques that have been passed down from generation to generation that is going to fuel our creative souls. And can we look at fashion and products in a different light? Can we give humanity to our creativity? Because craft can do that. Craft is about the touch and feel as, an, as I said, the interconnectedness of nature. And so craft can play such an amazing role because more importantly than the product is the storytelling. You know, the moment we focus on craft as you exemplary artisans have, we can talk about a different narrative. The language changes. We can talk about heritage, ancestors, animism, nature, environment, respect, dignity, morality, ethics, all of this comes into the medium of craft. Because when it's made by hand and made with a love and this, this consciousness for humanity, then the product doesn't remain just a product. The product becomes prized because it goes beyond just something that is beautiful or aesthetically pleasing. It, go, it, it, it talks about the people behind it, their lives, their families, their communities. It talks about processes. How slow is the process? How much time does it take to weave, to craft a piece of jewelry with your hand involved people? And while you're making it, is that not meditation of some kind? And so craft brings in all these ideological um, terminologies that we have forgotten in the fast fashion world, or even in the high fashion world, where our narrative is so much about gain, profit, trend, the transience, the heroine of our times is, you know, the trends that have to change every season and make us buy more and more for less and less with giving no respect to the people who make them the invisible hands that touch them, the invisible faces that go into making a single garment or a piece of jewelry. Craft can resurrect the humanity. And for that, I'm truly grateful to all you artisans and designers who focus on communities and made by hand cultures to bring this conversation to the forefront because it's about time that we went beyond just consumerism. This affects people's lives and humanity and dignity. And how we buy and what we buy and how we consume is directly affecting climate change. So are we climate warriors? We must be. Are we activists as consumers? We must be. That is our birthright to be an activist. And when we come to craft cultures of the world, the one thing I would love to reiterate, and I say this in perhaps almost every talk, is that when you are working with craft, and let this be something that each one of us can propagate to the others, is that with craft, there must be a, a fundamental understanding of how we are going to engage with the craft traditions of the world. For far too long, we've seen big brands pillage from the customs and the traditions of ancient age old traditions of Mexico, of Romania, of India, all these incredible civilizations where the artisans 
and the generations before them who created those techniques have not been given any credit. So if you want to get more information on this, you please go on to culturalintellectualpropertyrights.org. And there it's listed very, very poignantly that there are the three C's that should be fundamental to anyone involved in the craft traditions of the world. Number one is consent. Please make sure that whoever is involved in the craft traditions of the world, you get the consent of the community that you're taking from, that you get the consent of the culture that you're taking from. Second is credit. Please credit the provenance of what you're using, whether it's a piece of embroidery, a technique um, that has been passed down from generations, something that a grandmother holds on to. So they need to get the credit. Where does it come from? That is very important. Who has ownership over it? That is very important for people and consumers to know. And of course, the third is compensation, that they must get money for what you have borrowed from their traditions, that it cannot not be compensated. So the three C's are pretty simple. Consent, credit, compensation, when you're working with craft. What craft allows, personally me as a writer, uh, as a storyteller, is what a wonderful opportunity we have during COVID times to understand the significance of what regionality means. We have lived far too long in a world that was so homogenized that we became a globalized world of tees and hoodies. And in that process of fast fashion production, where we all lost our identity, our regionality, we forgot how to celebrate difference. So what craft cultures can teach us today, which you as designers and design intervention professionals of the world and artisans on the top of the pyramid, as far as I'm concerned, what you can teach us as, a con as consumers is that craft brings in the kind of narrative we need now during COVID times to remind us of our humanity, to remind us that when we pull ourselves out of this mess, what kind of a person are you going to be? Because what we consume is going to define who we are. So all of this is so interrelated. And I talk a lot about, when you reach a stage where you're talking about this interconnectivity, interrelatedness, or what, what this brilliant Vietnamese Buddhist monk who Dr. Martin Luther King recommended for the Peace Prize, Nobel Peace Prize, she uses the word interbeing. So if we elevate ourselves into being these interbeings that so fundamentally and intrinsically understand how we are connected to nature, our environment, then how is craft not a spiritual act? How is sustainability not a spiritual act? So well, that is where craft is concerned. And now let me move on to Kranti. Kranti is, I'm going to actually get a tattoo and that's going to say Kranti in Sanskrit, which means revolution from inside. And there's a wonderful quote by Gandhi when he says, when the enemy is within, why fight an external war? So this revolution of the self is about changing our own personal habits, um, consuming habits to affect change in the wider world. For far too long, we've looked at sustainability as something that is so vague and we always expect policy change and government intervention, NGOs to come to the forefront, which is all wonderful. We do need that, but very, seldom do we realize what is our personal hand in, in this dialogue? And what am I as a human being doing or not doing to uphold the ideals of being a sustainable human being? So Kranti, revolution of the self, is about taking personal ownership. And I derive all this inspiration, obviously, from Mahatma Gandhi, who, when he said, be the change you want to see in the world comes very much from acknowledging that it's your inner self, your inner enemy that we have to fight first before we go and affect change 
in the world. And I am a true believer in this. And that takes me again, straight to the heart of, if I start changing myself, if my sense of morality is going to affect how I deal with the world that is full of species, our environment, and if it's a good act, then how is that not a spiritual act? So let me go back to, again, back to Sanskrit. Um, in the Vedas, I'm talking about secular uh, philosophy of karma and dharma. You know, I grew up, uh, I'm Nepali, grew up in India, so you can well imagine that the Vedas and the Sanskrit philosophies play a huge role in our lives. And we tend to sort of undermine the importance of these words that are so loaded. Dharma, karma, I mean, here in Bali, everyone probably got it tattooed on their bodies without understanding what they mean. But from my little bit of understanding, let me tell you, what I follow is that dharma is your moral compass. What defines your morality, your personal morality. So if you're given any situation in life, you can choose this way or that way. And that is decided by your own moral compass. And the decision that you make is then what defines your karma, your destiny. But you are in full ownership of your destiny. The destiny is not bereft of your personal will. So the more I look at sustainability, which are all interrelated, right? Craft, made by hand, sustainability, community. They're also interrelated. I have to say, I am just veering towards what I really believe. If you're a sustainable human being, then you're a spiritual human being. And that is a very powerful thing to feel really inside you, feel within the revolution of your soul. I know that you know it sounds abstract and esoteric, but it's time that we dipped into great philosophies of the past, wisdom of the sages, to be an activist in your head and be a sage in your heart. You know, I think that's the way forward. We need leaderships of different kinds, Buddhist leadership. I just read a paper on Buddhist economy, which is fascinating. We need sage politics. So we need to take ownership of what this revolution of the self means and how important it is to impact change in our communities and perhaps our nations, and in fact, our world. And before I leave, I want to use an anecdote which, which I really love because it's so simple and it's so pure. And it's the same Vietnamese Buddhist monk that I was talking about whom Dr. Martin Luther King nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. She used to run an exercise with the audience who came to listen to her. And she would give them a piece of white paper plain white paper and make them stare into that piece of paper. And she would say, look into that white empty piece of paper. If you're a poet, then you will see that there are clouds in it. And if you know if there are clouds, that means it's full of rain. And if there was no rain, it wouldn't feed our forests. If the forests didn't get the rain, there would be no trees. If there were no trees, there would be no lumberjacks to cut it and turn them into pieces of paper that you're looking at. So the entire universe is in that white sheet of paper that you're holding. Of course, I'm paraphrasing. If you Google her, you'll see how eloquently she says it. And for me, these are the anecdotes and wisdom that propel me personally to push my dialogue on sustainability further because we need a change of heart Let's leave the policies to the, the governments. Let people take ownership over the different uh, stakeholders who need to take their own responsibilities. But as individuals, what is my responsibility? So for me, my focus on craft and kranti makes me feel exhilarated for a good change, for change that is going to benefit both our environment and the people. And thank you very much for listening to me. Well, 
that was amazing. Uh, and there she is. That was a great transition from uh, day to evening. And hello, Vandana. Hi, I'm sorry. I look so orange. It reminds me of Trump and make, it's making me feel a little miserable. <laughs> but it's late here. And I just have one lamp in my house. So this is all you're going to get. <laughs> no, you look beautiful. And, uh, you know, that was, uh, that was, that stirred so much, you know, emotions in me, everything you shared. Uh, I hope it did to the attendees as well. And I know it's late out there. Thank you so much uh, for being here. Uh, probably it's past your dinner time. <laughs> so we won't take much of your time. Yes, not at all. I'm so happy and grateful to be here. So don't worry about me. It's not that late and I'm fine. I'm okay. just worried about how orange I look. <laughs> well, everyone's <laughs> excited to see you here. And um, just to move on to uh, the first question, uh, as artisanal brands, uh, what can we do to influence and impact consumer lifestyle um, to make them care? Well, you know, I'm a writer. Thank you for your question. It's a beautiful question. I'm a storyteller and the only way I can make consumers resonate with the story of the artisan or the products that they're making is when your story is deep, when you haven't left behind pieces of the storytelling and found a shortcut to talking about this journey of creativity that involves a lot of people, communities, as we all know, with the artisanal world. So the more deep you go into your story, the more <clears throat> sort of, you know, data you give me to work with as a writer to, to allow the storytelling to resonate and have depth. So don't undermine how far you can go with your story because where you're making your products, who you're engaging, what community is involved in which families you're helping. These are, this is extraordinary stories that we should be celebrating. So the deeper you give, go into your own story and give us this feedback, then we as writers will have something valuable to talk about. And don't underestimate um, the editorial content that you bring to the table. Okay, that is wonderful. And then we have another question. Um, although it kind of, you know, it is by Tejas Tar. It is focusing on, you know, India. What are the challenges faced by India in the, uh, you know, uh, uh, post-COVID uh, world? But I think it would be great if you could also uh, throw us your insight globally as well. How, how do you see this impacting? Yeah, I think it's all over the world. I don't think it's just India. The, the common ground is the artisanal world have similar problems everywhere, right? Um, and the climate crisis is actually affecting the lives of people who are far removed from the most polluting countries in the world. Um, I think, you know, with India, of course, and I, I live in Indonesia, the, 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 I see the same problems everywhere because of COVID. But let me not be pessimistic about this. What I've also seen is that you have the biggest supporters, the artisanal world are the biggest supporters today in the young, smaller businesses, fashion, product, design businesses all over the world that are now willing to say bigger is not better. We want to work with a sense of uh, kindness and compassion and consciousness and not just sort of take over but become co-creators and there are all these young designers who are literally participating in the journey as the artisans are and understanding their plight and wanting to co-create so i'm actually quite optimistic that you know of course systems have to be changed but covid has affected everyone it doesn't matter if you're a billionaire it's affected you too right um but the good thing that's come out of COVID is that people have become more cognizant of other people's pain or the struggles and the challenges that they're going through. And I see tons of designers all over the world who are now collaborating with artisans all over the world in their own backyard, because regionality means something now, because we all, you know, we have boundaries that we can't cross. So we have to dip into our own background a backyard for 
inspiration, for resources. So I see a lot of activity taking place with uh, designers and communities in their countries. So I want to be optimistic that COVID has taught us a few lessons that we will carry forward even when this nonsense is over. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for that. And I know we are, um, we have the next panel to begin, but I do, uh, I would, I do want to make sure there are many questions that's coming here. Uh, I have taken a screenshot. There's so many windows on my screen right now, but this is one question uh, I wanted to ask. How can we convince uh, our customers to pay the extra price for something artisanal as they always shy away from giving that extra and understanding the value of handmade vis-a-vis uh, -vis the branded products. Uh, great question from someone in the audience. I love this question because I address it several times. We don't think twice about buying, you know, high brand labeled flip-flops made out of plastic that costs more than a handmade sari that is, that takes sometimes two years to be woven in, let's say, in India, or a beautiful uh, ikat from Sumba in Indonesia. I mean, I can go on and on. You know, I think we as you, as the artisan designers, collaborators, what have you, you have to understand the value of your story. The world is changing. You know, there are revolutions all over the world that you see upholding the rights and the dignity of work for people, not just in the craft industry or design industry, but you name it. We have farmers revolting in India right now and peacefully, they're revolting peacefully. I think the patience you need to have to convince people, that's a choice that you made. But you should also not shy away from saying, it does cost more to be a sustainable brand because we need all the bells and whistles to be a transparent brand. Let your customers know the story, what it takes to be a transparent brand, to be a sustainable brand that gives back to communities, that cares about the environment. That is a thing of value. So the onus is on all of us as media people, as storytellers, we should be talking about that. As consumers, we should be asking more questions. Why am I paying a little bit more for a sustainable brand? because it takes that much more effort than making cheap stuff that disintegrate and you dump it into a landfill. I don't think there's only one stakeholder in this. I think there's several, but we all need to recognize what roles we all play in asking the right questions and making our purchases with consciousness. And talking about stakeholders, I totally believe in you know um, everyone working together in this. One of our panels in the end is with different stakeholders, the academia, you know, there's the fashion designer, fashion house, and there's the textile conservationist. Um, that would be a wonderful conversation for, you know, the attendees. And I know I'm getting cue here that, you know, we're running a little bit late, but I have one last important question from one of our judges who represents, you know, the students. Uh, very quick one. What advice would you give to students who are studying fashion and textiles, who are inspired by cultures? Uh, is it possible to respectfully desi respectfully design using inspiration from another culture when you're a student. And I know this is one of the very important topics for you, but something very quick, uh, you know, inside. Yes, I'll, say, I'll, say, I'll say it very quickly. <laughs> of course, you should be inspired by other cultures. That's the joy of travel and, and respecting other cultures that are deep and imagine what inspires you. That is magical. But you can't be inspired without having a full idea of the context of your inspiration. You can't just dip in and put your beak in as a lot of the big fashion design houses have been doing where uh, you know, it's tokenism. You just take what is, looks lovely and then you show it with flourish in Paris Fashion Week or whatever it is and nothing goes back into the community. As I said in my talk, if you just keep the three C's in mind, you know, uh, consent, credit, compensation. Every time you dip into another culture with joy and with delight, you put those three C's as part of your dialogue, your fundamental truth about your creativity and your uh, co-creation with different cultures, then you're fine. It's wonderful to celebrate other people's other lands and other cultures. This is why we are curious, creative human beings. 
but we need to do that with respect and having a very clear understanding of the context, which is political, that can be social, personal. So you need to deep dive. There are no shortcuts to understanding of culture. I wouldn't expect anyone to understand my culture in one minute, and neither should you. Well, thank you so much, Pandana. Uh, well, we are, uh, you know, having uh, the judges, uh, whoever can make it, uh, join us in the end uh, when we announce the winners. So I know it's going to be very late, but just in case you're awake. I'll be around. I'll be around. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, well, great. And I am now going to introduce, oh, sorry, before I, uh, you know, before you head off, I want to tell the attendees, please do read some of the amazing articles written by Pandana. One of my favorite is following the threads of India's artisans okay so go about read I know there were many questions there uh, we'll try to get back to you another time uh, you okay? can email them to me yes. I'll have to be sure. all right we'll do so